We pulled that song out of the archives. Amen, guys? It's always good to sing some of those older hymns. At this time, the ushers are passing out a map that I think will, will greatly help us in our study today. For those that uh, are visiting, uh, we've been engaged in an overview of the book of Acts. And today, we're going to be covering essentially chapters 16 through 21. And I think the map will really help us as we, as we go through these, these passages. Traditionally, of course, it's held that Paul had three missionary journeys. Acts 13 through 14. At the end of Acts chapter 15 is where we'll pick up things today. And that goes to chapter 18 is the second missionary journey. And then in the latter part of chapter 18 through chapter 21 is the third missionary journey. Some people include a fourth. Of course, this one was by the Holy Spirit when, of course, Paul is taken to Rome for trial. The title of our lesson today, Turning the World Upside Down. Let's get to our text. Let's go to Acts chapter 15. The Jerusalem Council happens in about 49 A.D. And so most likely we begin reading, because the Bible starts out sometime later, this is probably about 50 A.D., which we begin reading in verse 36. Our first point is, the uplifting vision. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where he preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Verse 40. And Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, if you look at your map, on the far right-hand bottom corner, you'll find Jerusalem. And then this particular journey is kind of in a, a, a pink color. And it goes, you see, he heads north through Syria. And then he rounds the bend and starts heading west through Cilicia, where that was where Paul was from. And so we see that the first church that he hits from his earlier journey is Derby, and then Lystra, and Iconium, and the Antioch. Now, interestingly enough, if you'll see right here, the Roman provinces are in capital letters, like Cilicia, Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia. Now, those churches, Pisidian and Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, are located in southern Galatia. So, the book of Galatians is addressed to these churches. Amen? So, we read on. He's strengthening everything in Syria and, Galatia, Syria and Cilicia, and we read in chapter 16, verse 1. He came to Derby and then to Lystra. Now, of course, Lystra was where he was stoned and almost killed. Where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on a journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew this father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Well, right here, we see that, that Paul's work has really blossomed there in Derby, And he meets this incredible young disciple, Timothy. Now, his mom had become a Christian, perhaps in Paul's earlier visit. And we also find in 2 Timothy that his grandma is also a Christian. But we infer that his father is not. And we find right here that Paul is so fired up about meeting this man that was spoken well of in two churches. And you've got to admit, that must be a cranking brother, amen? He says, I want you to be on my mission team. Now, most people think that his age is probably somewhere between 15 and 18. And you can see the kind of heart that, that Timothy has about going. He says, Paul wanted to take him along, and so he circumcised him. Now, at first you say, well, hold it, this kind of contradicts the whole thing that happened in chapter 15 where the circumcision party had come to Jerusalem to face off against Paul and Silas and argue that if you're going to be saved, you have to be circumcised as well. Well, of course, we understand that Paul has a definitive strategy when he enters any city to evangelize it. Amen? He first of all goes to the synagogue, to the Jews, and then he goes to the Gentiles. Well, in order to enter the synagogue, then that person has to be circumcised. 
And so Paul says, hey, I want you with me. I want you with me all the way. And so I'm going to ask you to be circumcised so that you can go with me into the synagogue and preach the word. Now, the other thing that comes from this passage is the obvious. Here's a young man, 15, 18 years old. And Paul says, I want you on the mission team, but there's one thing that you've got to do. He goes, what's that? I'm ready to go. I got to circumcise you. Now, that's a lot of trust right there. You you know what I'm talking about right here? And so we understand and we can infer from that, hey, if we're really going to have an impact for the Lord, we've got to be willing to do anything, (laughs) go anywhere, and give up everything. That's what made Timothy's heart so special. Yeah, he was willing to go anywhere, but he was also willing to do anything, even circumcision. Amen? You know, I, I, was, I was so excited uh, last week just to, to hear Jack uh, preach about going to Washington, D.C. Here's a brother, 62 years old, and he still understands the principle of this scripture. You've got to be willing to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything for Jesus Christ. That's not just for the leaders like the Mahias. That's for all of us as disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen, guys? Well, it's kind of interesting in verse 4. It says, as they went from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. In the Bible, the churches were not autonomous. They, they were not independent. There was an authority outside of them, of apostles and evangelists, that called the people to obey the scriptures. Amen? By calling them to obey the scriptures and the dictates out of Jerusalem right here, it unified all the churches. That's one of the purposes of leadership is to produce unity. Amen, church? And then we read in verse 5, so encouraging. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. You know, in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, we read about the Jerusalem church, that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Acts 2.47, we go, that's just the Jerusalem church. But now we're reading all the churches were having daily additions. Set fire you on up right there. You know, someday here in L.A., we're going to have daily additions. Set fire you on up. That's the kind of church that we need to strive to be. Okay, let's go on right here. Verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, had been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Tros. Okay, get your maps out again right here. We see from here that Paul is heading out from Pisidian Antioch, right in the middle of Galatia, right next to Asia right there. And the Bible says that he was preaching the region of Phrygia and Galatia, but he was kept from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So at this particular time, for some reason, God was blocking him from Asia. Now, interestingly enough, Asia was the most affluent province of all the Roman Empire. Now, Paul wants to go there, but he's blocked. Then the Bible says, he came to the border of Mycenae, and you can see Mycenae is further up north right there. And they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Many conjectures have been made. Maybe there was some sort of conflict that was going on in this particular area of the Roman Empire. Maybe there was sickness. Maybe there's an epidemic of some sort. Or maybe there was some sort of a persecution that at least was blocking it. But, but something was stopping Paul from being able to go to Bithynia. And he seems very surrendered to it, and rightfully so. And so the Bible says that they go on down to Troas, which is right by the Aegean Sea right there. Let me read this. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right here, when the first night there in Troas, Paul has this unbelievably awesome dream of a man from Macedonia calling to him, Hey, come help us. Now, what's significant about that? Well, up to this point, most of Paul's efforts have taken place in what we know of as Asia Minor today or on the continent of Asia. But to go over to Macedonia would be to go over to the continent of Europe. In other words, right here, Paul's vision is being stretched to not just be centered 
where he was comfortable, but to go on to another continent. And here he begins to understand more fully God's charge to evangelize the nations in a generation. Are you with me right here? Shh. You know, some people have thought that perhaps this man, because it seems a man from Macedonia, how would you know? Well, supposedly it's somebody recognizable. So people have thought, well, maybe it's Alexander the Great or somebody to this effect. But the Bible is silent right there. But Paul was clear he was from Macedonia. You know, what's also interesting is this is the first time in our text that we find the pronoun we is used because Luke joins him here in Tros. And so now he's writing a first-hand account. What's interesting is Paul saw the vision and we got ready at once. So not everybody is a person of vision. But Luke understood that even though Paul had the vision, Timothy... Silas and himself were being called by God to preach the gospel. Is that awesome or not? So, the Lord has given the vision for Vic and Aurora to go down and plant the church in San Diego. Amen? Amen. But, bottom line, the Jacksons, the Friendsleys, Brandon, Ray, and Gabe, they didn't have the vision, but they're being called to be with them. And so they got ready at once, concluding not that God had simply sent Vic and Aurora to to preach the word, but that they too had been called to preach the word. Amen, guys? I think one little note right here. There are a lot of times our brothers who get very fired up to be preachers. Amen? And to do great things. And the sisters that are married to them say, well, okay, I'll go with you because I'm married to you. Well, right here, we need to understand the implication. (laughs) says if If your leader has a vision, if you're going with them, you've got to understand that you are being sent out to preach by God as well. Are you with me right here? And so right here, there's a challenge. Some of us don't have a vision beyond L.A. We need to stretch you a little bit here. You need to get the Macedonian vision. Say, are you thinking of another city in this country? Maybe on another continent. Where is your vision at? I know some of the crowd say, I know, I'm going to go to this city. Well, Lord willing, you go to that city. But maybe the Lord is trying to stretch your vision to go to another place. Amen? Amen. You say, well, I, I don't have any vision. Well, what happens if you get called to be on the mission team? Then you need to understand that God is calling you to preach the word. Amen, church? That is a very uplifting vision. Point two, side-by-side preaching. We're going to see the brothers now preach the word. Verse 11, from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Right now, we need to come to a conviction that Paul had a strategy with which he was to accomplish the purpose of God's life for him. Turn quickly, if you would, to Acts chapter 22. When Paul was being converted, a man named Ananias comes to him. And we read in verse 14 that Ananias says these words to Paul. The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. All right here, we see the urgency attached to getting baptized. Amen. Before you can fulfill God's destiny for your life, you've got to become one of his sons or one of his daughters. Amen. But I think right here we also see that it was given to Paul. What a charge. It was given to Paul that he was to go to all men to make sure that they heard the gospel. So he's trying to figure out how he's had his vision stretch. Okay, not just Asia, but now Europe, the world. How do I get to all men? Well, there's a strategy that he begins to form. Look right here. You have to ask the question. Why doesn't he start a church in Tros? Why doesn't he start a church on the island of Samothrace? Why doesn't he start a church in Neapolis? Well, 
the Bible kind of tells us right here in verse 12. He wanted to go to Philippi, which is about nine miles from Neapolis. You can see that on your map right there. Why? It was the leading city of the district of Macedonia. See, Paul had learned from his efforts in Pisidian Antioch in Acts chapter 13, in verse 49, that when you preached to the city, it would influence the whole region around it. And the more influential the city, the larger the region. Are you with me right here, guys? So we see, first of all, that Paul's going to go to the most influential cities of the world. Secondly, he's going to try to convert opinion leaders, the most influential people in those cities. Let's move on. Verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who'd gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her house were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Right here, it's my conviction, and shared by most commentators, that there was no synagogue there at Philippi. But there was simply a place of prayer. Now, some would argue that the place of prayer was the synagogue, but I think we'll see from another passage that most likely there was not a synagogue. In order to have a synagogue, there have to be 10 Jewish men. That's by Jewish law in order to form a synagogue. And so it's interesting to me, he goes to the place of prayer and he meets this woman who's a very powerful woman. She's name is Lydia. She's a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Tartara. And she was a worshiper of God. In other words, she was a Gentile. And she was a very high-powered person because to deal in purple cloth was a very, very rich business. And there was a, a very rare shellfish in the Mediterranean Sea called a murex, which they got the dye in order to dye the cloth purple. And, of course, purple is the color that represents royalty or, or kings. And so it was a very special cloth. And so this was a very powerful businesswoman right here. And the Bible says the Lord opens her heart. And not only was she baptized... But all of her household was baptized. That fire you want up right there. And then the Bible says she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuade us. Now, yes, it's impressive that you can persuade Paul of anything. So you know she's a high-powered woman. Amen? But really the notation here is made by Luke because this woman is a Gentile. She says, if I'm a believer in the Lord, then come and stay at my house. Prove it. That in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. And Paul said, he was persuaded. <laughs> Let's move on. This is, this is awesome, this next part, guys. Once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Wouldn't you like to have that happen to you as you're walking around campus or your neighborhood? <laughs> she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Things are beginning to heat up, are they not? What's interesting is the fact that the word spirit in the Greek here is actually two words. It's pneuma python. Pneuma meaning spirit, but python meaning python. And it, it, it has a, a very strong message that's being sent. It shows the rarity of this slave girl. It centers in on the fact that there was a, a myth, a Greek myth, that Apollos, the god Apollos, killed a giant python in Delphi. Now Delphi, is, as you can see on your map, is further down close to Athens right there. It's about 80 miles from Athens. And the Delphi Oracle was the most famous of all the oracles in the ancient world. People would come from all over the Mediterranean to hear what the gods were going to say with them. 
and the priestess would go into this cave where supposedly Apollos had killed the python, and it was also supposedly the entrance to the underworld, and there they would be filled with, quote, the spirit, and when they came on out, they would utter ecstatic utterances that were supposedly the words of the gods. And so for this woman to have a pneuma python, in other words, a spirit of the python, this was a slave girl that got her training in Delphi, the very place that the gods spoke. And so she was rare indeed. Now, it's interesting to me that she has it absolutely right. She says, these men are the servants of the Most High God. They're telling you the way to be safe. Now, it hurts your evangelism a little bit to have someone like that wandering around you all day. But on the other hand, she was right. Now, here's the kicker of it all. Paul casts out the spirit, and the Bible says in verse 19, when the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. Well, the Greek on that actually reads this. Their hope of making money had gone out from her. So the Bible doesn't just blow this off as some mythical spirit. The Bible says this is a real spirit. We understand it to be demonic. They understood the, the, the Numa Python to be a benevolent spirit that was only for good. And so it was for their good because it made a lot of money. I mean, guys. But when Paul casts out the spirit and the Bible says he cast it out, then they were upset because now their way of making money is gone. So they're brought before the magistrates and we begin to read this. Verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, compared to Paul and Silas, how's your week been? You know, I know some of us, because I've been with you, have had in your mind some very tough days. Some of you have been down. Some of you stopped reading your Bible. Some of you stopped sharing your faith. Some of you have been consumed with your lives. And yet, look what Paul's gone through. Beaten. Thrown into jail, into the inner cell, shackled. So what's his attitude? Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Is that flat awesome or not? When you have a bad week, it's just time to stay up till midnight and sing and praise God. Amen, guys? Here we go. Look what happens. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Jailer called for light, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, he's not asking the spiritual question right here. What can I do to be saved? No, no, no. We understand, you remember that little account in Acts chapter 12? When the Roman guards let go of Peter... When they lost their prisoner, the Roman guards were executed. And here the chief jailer is going, oh man, I'm, I, I don't want what's going to happen to me if all these prisoners escape. I'm sure I'm going to be tortured and then I'm going to be killed. I'll just shortcut it. I'll just kill myself. He was hopeless. That's why people get suicidal. They are absolutely hopeless. And you know, this time of year is the time of year when more people get suicidal than any other time. Because they're so hopeless. But as disciples, what an opportunity for us to bring them the hope of Jesus Christ. Are you with me here, church? Look at what Paul does. Paul never wanted to miss an opportunity. Verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. I mean, that just brings a smile to your face, doesn't it? You say, well, uh, Kip, how, 
This just happened in one day. I correct you, in one night. That's pretty awesome. You see the repentance right here. He washes the wounds of which he may have been the one that commanded them to be flogged. And after he's baptized, he's so grateful to God. But to those that brought the message, he sets a meal before them. Say, one day, could someone really become a disciple? You know, you know a sister that I, I know is beloved by so many of us is uh, Megan Baird. And, uh, I mean, her story is so powerful. She's in Toronto. Of course, we had a little remnant group there with Tim and Leanne. And one of the brothers, Johnny, just reached out on the subway to her, shared his faith, says, hey, come to my church. Well, it kind of got her attention because Megan had come from a very rough background. She had uh, been through some really tough things with a, a drug and alcohol background, and, and she was seeking God. And she thought about it. But then on Friday, she goes to this restaurant, and behind the counter, there was Johnny. And Johnny goes, I recognize you. She goes, you're the person that invited me. And she immediately understood that God was at work. Say, like, where is your church again? She went there on Sunday morning, got convicted by the word of God, and she says, I need to study until I know enough to become a disciple and then to be baptized to be saved. And she was baptized at 11 o'clock that night. Does that fire you on up or not? Well, the jailer and his family were fired up. Why did he get baptized in the middle of the night? Because he wasn't promised tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Let's read on. Verse 35. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent the officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. Well, that's kind of interesting. Most likely, after Paul had gotten the meal, the jailer goes, Guys, i got to take you back to prison. <laughs> Paul submits. Whatever it takes. He doesn't want his brother to get killed. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. Now, Paul had some feelings right here. Shh. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. <laughs> Paul was going to leave on his own timetable. But he also was beginning to understand the value of why God had made him a Roman citizen. It would serve to protect him and propel his ministry forward in unbelievable ways in the future. What's interesting to me right here, is when he came to Lydia's house, by this time, there were a lot of brothers that were Christians. And he encouraged them. And then the Bible simply says, then they left. So we infer Luke stays on in Philippi to help the young church. Amen? Yep. Now, let's go to chapter 17. When they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Well, Thessalonica is about 100 miles away, as you can see on the map. And the question comes, why pass through these other significant cities? Amphipolis and Apollonia. Well, because Thessalonica was the seat of the Roman government and the capital of Macedonia. It was, in fact, the largest city in all of Macedonia. It was, it was once more an influential city in the known world. Amen. So we see the strategy that Paul's implying. Go to the major cities. As his custom was, Paul went to the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you as the Christ, he said, some of the Jews were persuaded to join Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. Well, we're going to see wherever Paul builds a church, he evangelizes opinion leaders at the beginning. Because opinion leaders lead other people's opinions. Now, opinion leaders don't have to be just rich people like Lydia. You know, if, if you're leading a gang in South Central, you may not be in the plushest neighborhood, but let me tell you something, you're leading a lot of opinions. There are opinion leaders in every social economic group there is. And so, as disciples who want to build a church, we've got to be bold. 
We've got to be very bold and be like Paul and evangelize opinion leaders. Amen, church? Look on. But the Jews were jealous. Why? So many people were joining them. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house and searched upon Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Of course, Revised Standard Version says, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Of course, that was a derogatory remark to turn the world upside down. But we understand Paul and the brothers were turning the world right side up. Amen? And that's got to be all heart to turn the world upside down for Jesus. Now, this is interesting. Verse 7. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying there's another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. You know, at first glance, you go, why is everybody... Now, I understand why the Jews are upset. There's a jealousy. Paul's taking people out of the synagogue to be Christians. But why are these Gentiles so upset? Yes, we have a quiet reference right here that says that he was teaching this another king, one called Jesus. But it says the charges, they are defying Caesar's decrees. Well, very interestingly, one of the most famous decrees was by Augustus Caesar in 11 AD. And it spoke to the fact that no one could predict the death of someone in Caesar's family. That was a, a wicked, wicked thing to do. And so almost all the cities of the Roman empires had oaths that they took in allegiance to Caesar. Here's one of the oaths of, of a city. Each person in the city had to do this. I swear I will support Caesar and his children in word and deed. I will spare neither body or soul, life or children. Whenever I see or hear anything planned and or spoken against them, I will regard these people as my enemies. I will attack and pursue them with the sword over land and sea until their death. So when it came upon these Gentiles that Paul was preaching a king, a new king of the whole world, this would have been defying the decree of Caesar. And now we understand, at least in part, why these people were so upset and so quick to attack. They had taken an oath to that effect. Amen? Verse 10. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Wow! Once more, opinion leaders were baptized at the beginning. Amen? Verse 13. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, then left him with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Well, one of the things that we learn right here is that wherever Paul preached the word, persecution would soon follow. Bad attitudes would seek after trying to destroy the ministry of God. And we need to understand, that happens today. And as disciples of Jesus Christ, we cannot be surprised by persecution. There are people that are against God's ministry. What we're doing. They want to destroy it. Just like here in the first century. It also was a signal to Paul for him to move on. In this particular case... He leaves Silas and Timothy there in Berea, and he himself is taken by boat down to Athens. And so we find this very interestingly in, in verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now, why go to Athens? Well, it was the intellectual capital of the world, still, even in this day, even beyond Alexandria. 
And so Paul wanted to get to Athens. Now, one challenge that Paul had, he was all alone. All alone in the intellectual capital of the world. Doesn't have his brothers with him. So maybe he just needs to take a step back and have a time of prayer and fasting. No, that's what Paul does. Verse 17, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. I mean, he preached the word, and he lays it on out. We're familiar with the passage. We're familiar, of course, with the fact that uh, he goes to the Areopagus, which Ares, meaning Mars, the, the god Mars, Apicus meaning hill, Mars Hill, where this very powerful council met. And Paul preaches to them, both Epicureans and Stoics. Of course, kind of different uh, areas of influence right there. Of course, the, the Epicureans were, you know, pleasure is the beginning and the end of all life. And, of course, the uh, Stoics, you know, pursuit of virtue is the primary good. And he preaches to these people. He preaches the resurrection. And we read this in verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. Wow! Even a member of the Areopagus became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And one of the early Christian historians, Eusebius, writes in about 170 AD that Dionysus became the bishop of Athens. Now, bishop wasn't a formalized office, as, you know, Paul later wrote about in 1 Timothy chapter 3 right there. The bishop of Athens really was what we would kind of call the lead evangelist right there. And so we begin to see that by converting opinion leaders like Lydia, like these prominent men and women in Thessalonica and Berea, and like Dionysus and Demarius, it provided leadership for the early church. Are you with me right here? Amen. You know, I've just got to ask you, ask you are, are you evangelizing opinion leaders? Are you reaching out to people where you have to pray for boldness? Or do you simply reach out to people that you feel quite comfortable evangelizing? That's really you and your arrogance just wanting to evangelize those people in some ways you consider lesser than yourself. You need to pray for boldness. I got a challenge for you. I want to challenge you to reach out to the most intimidating person in your life. Your boss at work, a professor at school, a leader in the neighborhood. I challenge you to do it before next Sunday. Do you take the challenge? Guys, do you take the challenge? Amen. Let's hold to it. Amen. Now, chapter 18, we get to Corinth. Point three comes from Paul's writing to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where he says we were struck down, but not destroyed. Of course, I love the Phillips translation. It says, knocked down, but not knocked out. Amen, guys? So we find some tough, tough going right here in Corinth. Let's read about it. Verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see him, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Well, once more, why Corinth? Well, Corinth was the capital of the province of Acacia. So it's a capital city. Secondly, I mean, it was a den of iniquity. One of the largest temples in the whole Roman world was there. It was a temple to Aphrodite. And there were over a thousand male and female prostitutes. To worship the Roman gods, you went and you had sex as a way to commune with the gods. That is how gross the pagan world had become. And so Paul comes to that city, but it's a very interesting setting upon which he'd come. The Bible says that a few years earlier, Aquila and Priscilla 
had come to that city because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Well, that's very interesting. Suetonius, one of the Roman historians, in 49 AD records that Claudius kicked out all the Jews from Rome because there was a conflict amongst them over a man named Christus. Now we as disciples understand what's going on right here. The Romans didn't see Jews and Christians. The Romans just saw Jews. And they saw a huge conflict within Judaism. And of course, it was over the preaching of Jesus Christ and people becoming followers of Jesus. Amen. He gets so fed up with the Jews that he kicks out the Jews and the Christians. In particular, Quilla Priscilla, and they land in Corinth. Now, a lot of people think, I can't believe it. I've been kicked out of my home. I took a stand for Jesus, and now the Roman emperor has kicked me out of my home. But God had a purpose. Amen? Yeah. See, sometimes when bad things happen to us, God is guiding you to the place he wants you to be. Yeah. And so they land in Corinth, not by chance, but by God. Paul has run out of money at this point. So he has to turn to the trade that he has as a Pharisee, which is tent making. Well, sure enough, Aquila and Priscilla also are tent makers, and they find each other, and they build a relationship, a partnership, if you will, that's going to last a lifetime. God brings them together through the hardship of being kicked out of Rome, Paul's hardship of not having any money, their common trade. They are now bonded together, and they're preaching the word every day in the sinful city of Corinth. Does that fire you on up or not, church? Now look at this, verse 5. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Well, it's well documented that the church in Philippi gave money to Paul. And he, Paul, when he got the money, he says, bag the tent making, I'm preaching the word full time. Amen. Verse 6. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes and protested and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justice, a worshiper of God, a Gentile. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. Now, this is the same Crispus that Paul remembers as he writes the book of 1 Corinthians. He says, I didn't baptize very many of you guys. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, I baptized Crispus and Gaius. And so some people think that Titus Justus got another name, Gaius, right here. But we find that reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Well, look what happens. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one's going to attack or harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching the word of the Lord. Wow. God speaks to Paul. And he says, do not be afraid. You know why he said, do not be afraid? Because Paul was afraid. He was afraid. That's why God says, don't be afraid. How does he comfort him? By the words, I will be with you. How did God comfort Moses? I will be with you. How did God comfort Joshua? I will be with you. How did God comfort Jeremiah? I will be with you. How did Jesus comfort the apostles? You go make disciples, and I will be with you. And he tells Paul, don't be afraid, for I will be with you. Wherever you go, if you're making disciples for Jesus Christ, God is with you. Amen, guys? Paul stays there for a year and a half, and God says, I have many people in this city. Now, these weren't baptized yet. But God looks down from heaven and he sees people that are going to be if a disciple gets to them. This is, this is a shocking, shocking truth. God limits himself with our faith. He has said that we're the ones to go make disciples. God doesn't make disciples. He just saves them. But if we do not go and make disciples, people will not be saved. Now you can see what a horrible wickedness it is for disciples, for Christians, not to be evangelistic. 
Do you need to repent? Are you out there every day preaching the word like Paul, even when he was alone in Athens? Have you been afraid and just need to be remembering God is with you? Church, it's time to preach the word. Amen. I realize that many of the Bible talks will have their last session this next week or the following week. That doesn't mean you stop sharing your faith. People need to hear desperately at this time. Let's read on. Verse 12. But Galileo was proconsul in Achaia. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man they charged is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, If you Jews were making a complaint of, about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names in your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I'll not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Gallio showed no concern, whatever. Wow. The Jews, led by Sosthenes, the new synagogue ruler. Why? Because Crispus became a disciple. Okay? So we got a new synagogue ruler here, Sosthenes. He's bringing this whole issue up of the Christians to Gallio, the council for all that Roman province. He says, listen, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So he throws everybody out. And then even his own people turn on Sosthenes and start beating him on up. Say, well, what good came out of that? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul called to be apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth. Sosthenes becomes a disciple as well. Not just a disciple, he becomes one of the writers of the letters of the word of God. Now do you know why Paul was going after opinion leaders? And even people that were against them, he shared his faith with because he knew they needed Jesus Christ as well. Are you with me there, church? Well, we find in the latter part of chapter 18, Paul drops off Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. He heads back to Jerusalem and then up to Antioch. And then he himself heads back to Ephesus. We, of course, remember the occasion during Paul's absence where Priscilla and Aquila reach out to Apollos. And, of course, he becomes, as the Bible says right here, uh, following the way of God more adequately. He's rebaptized. Paul himself goes to Ephesus and he finds 12 other guys who know only the baptism of John. And he rebaptizes these guys in the name of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, he lays their hands on them and gives them the miraculous gifts. And so we pick up the action right here in verse 8. Okay. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with them and had daily discussions with the hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Well, the question again is asked, why go to Ephesus? As archaeologists have unearthed many of the old structures back from the first century, there's been a phrase that has been repeated many times throughout the city. The phrase they found on several buildings is, first and greatest city of Asia. That was how they knew themselves. They called themselves the first and greatest city of Asia. Now, if you look at your map, you see Asia is a large part of the western part of what's modern-day Turkey. The Bible says right here that Paul starts on the campus with some disciples there. He preaches the word every day, and in two years' time, all of Asia had heard the word of the Lord. Well, if you look very carefully right there, you'll see seven cities that are in red. Those are the seven churches of Asia spoken about in the book of Revelation. These were started most likely during that two-year period by those disciples originally there at that campus ministry at Tyrannus. Does that fire you on up? First of all, do you see the strategy of campus ministry? Do you see the strategy of being in the major city to influence the whole area? Of course, we understand that there are other cities in Asia besides these seven. 
But of course, the Holy Spirit was writing to the seven churches of Asia, the number seven meaning perfect. And so, in fact, the letter was meant not just to the seven churches, but all the churches all over the world. Amen, guys? Well, let's read on in verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit asked them, Jesus I know, I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Shh. Bottom line, you don't mess with the occult. It's real. You see those places that say psychic? You don't go there. Horoscopes, you don't read them. You say, I don't believe in that stuff. You better. It's evil. It's of Satan. It's demonic. It's not to be messed with. Look at this, verse 7. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed the evil deeds. A number who practiced sorcery brought the scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Wow. We see right here at the very end that the church were not isolated groups. It was the word of God spreading as the movement of God. Amen, guys? Now, it's kind of interesting right here. We see a radical repentance that's brought about by their fear of the Lord and their fear of the occult. And the Bible says that they burned all these scrolls, and the total value was 50,000 drachma. Now, a drachma was a day's wage. So what was the value of the stuff they burned? If you had 150 men working for a year, and they gave all of their salary to purchase these scrolls, that's the value of the scrolls. 50,000 drachma. There's got to be radical repentance. You know, I was very impressed uh, just uh, a month or so ago uh, at the changes that Salud Gonzalez made. And one of the things was the hardliness of her, of her father, Victor. And when push came to shove and she started counting the cost, one of the things that had really damaged her and spun her out was that she had been molested at an early age inside of a church. Now that'll mess you up. And that doesn't excuse all the sins that she went ahead and did. But nonetheless, there had to be a dealing with that issue. And so Victor said, okay, if you're really ready to get baptized, we have one thing we got to go do. They got in the car, and they went to the home so Salud could face her perpetrator and forgive him. Listen, when we make disciples in this church, there needs to be radical repentance, guys. That's what disciples do, and that's what disciples call each other to be. Amen? Amen. Very interesting. Let me read this. Verse 21. After all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, I said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. A couple things to be seen here. Number one, preachers in the first century were sent by other preachers. When Timothy and Erastus went to Macedonia, they didn't go for an interview and say, hey guys, is it okay if we minister here? Or do you guys like us enough to, to you know, have us be working amongst you? No, they were sent there by Paul. Amen? We don't do interviews in God's church. Secondly, we see right here that Paul is beginning to formulate his plan to evangelize the world. He says, you know something? I've got to go to Rome. For Rome holds the most influential person in the world, Caesar. And it's the most influential city in the world. If I can but get there, all men will know about Jesus Christ and his church. So this is what he's thinking to himself. Well, the end of chapter 19, there's a gigantic riot in Ephesus. They, they, they fill up the Colosseum there. They don't know why they're, they're having this riot against the Christians. Long story short, they're disbanded. You can read about it. It's all good. Chapter 20 right here. Getting to our, our last point. Make the most 
of today. Verse 1. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back to Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopatus and Epirus from Berea, Aristarchus and Segundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, Tychius and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Trohos. Wow. Luke has rejoined Paul. Waited for us. Secondly, notice that Paul took along with him the most cranking young men in the churches that he ministered to. Well, why did he do that? Because he wanted to train them, yes, individually, but he wanted them to have a relationship with each other. So that when they went out to different cities, they'd be preaching the same message with the same doctrine and the same life, and there would be unity and love between the churches because the leaders had unity and love between them. Are you with me right here? Yeah. See, that's why we've got Michael Williamson and Michael Patterson and Raul right here right now. They're together as friends, and they're knitting relationships as future leaders in the kingdom. That's why we're bringing in Andrew Smelly in a month. That's going to be awesome, amen. And then Tim Kernan next summer. I mean, all these brothers are going to be able to minister together. Yes, they'll be trained individually, but they'll build a relationship that will last a lifetime and will knit our young movement together all around the world. Does that fire you on up to see your church in the Bible? Well... Paul goes on back down to Tros, and we've got to read this in verse 7. On, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. So by this time, communion had become a weekly thing in God's church. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking till midnight. There are many lamps in the upstairs room who are present in the meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Now, I don't know whether they were greatly comforted because the young man was risen from the dead or Paul finally stopped talking. I don't know which it was. But I think there's some things to learn from this. Number one, don't fall asleep at church. Or something bad may happen to you. <laughs> Number two, though, don't be a clock watcher. The people in the early church are like, oh, man, we get Paul. Kip, are you saying that the preacher has a right to preach till midnight? No, I'm not. Because the text actually reads that Paul preached till midnight, went down and raised the guy from the dead, ate, and then talked till the morning. That preacher can talk all night. Are you with me right here? And we need to understand we are listening to the word of God. Well, Paul's in a rush to get back to Jerusalem for the Pentecost. Why? That's a celebration when the kingdom began. And he stops off in Miletus and calls the Ephesian elders down to meet him there, and he gives them a charge. And the Bible says that he reminded them of the kind of life that he lived amongst them. In verse 31, remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Wow. Some people have argued, should we have individual discipling or group discipling? Well, the Bible says right here, A, he was discipling them as a group, and B, he tells them, hey, I never stopped warning each of you individual discipling night and day with tears. That's the kind of relationships we need to have. Are you committed to your discipling relationship? Are you willing to get in there, whether people have time during the day, or whether you have to make time during the night? Or are you just flat too busy to disciple other people and get discipled? You don't make time to get people in your life, I will guarantee you will fall away. You may never stop coming to church, but you will fall away. We need people in our lives to challenge our hearts, to challenge our thinking, so that we stay alive in Christ. Are you with me right here? Well, Paul tells them that he's leaving. And so we read in verse 36. We had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. 
What grieved them most was the statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to ship. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. You know, there are many changes that are going on in our congregation right now. Changes of leadership. And it's going to be a huge loss to hold, have the Holy Spirit send Ashley to Honolulu. It's going to be a huge loss to send out the DC-5 and the San Diego 9. And these words right here are true. After we had torn ourselves away. We have some awesome relationships here in the church. And so when someone leaves, it is a tearing away. And sometimes I've seen disciples, when people leave, they want to pull back their heart because they don't want to get hurt again by someone leaving them. But first of all, we need to remember that all of us stay faithful. We're going to see each other in heaven. And that's going to last for eternity. Amen, guys? Secondly, it's vital to keep relationships in other churches and to have a multitude of relationships across our movement. Thirdly, though, you can't pull your heart back. You can't pull it back. You've got to continue to deny yourself, even if your heart feels like it's been torn away by someone leaving. Or you're challenged by the fact, uh-oh, I'm going to get a new discipler. I've had this discipler all my spiritual life, all six months, and that's the only one I've ever known, and they'll never be as good as this one. Maybe God's saying, hey, we need another change right here. You need this person to disciple you. No, they're just not like me. Perfect. That's exactly who you need to have. We need to get fired up about change because God brings about change. Amen? Well, we find that uh, Paul's heading on back. He stops off in Caesarea, and he stays at the home of Philip the Evangelist. And it's pretty cool right here in verse 8. It says, leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. That's very cool. The guy that converted Simon the sorcerer, the guy that converted the Ethiopian eunuch, he settled down, got married to an awesome sister, and had four girls. <laughs> and the Bible says they all prophesied. And of course, Luke is reminding us of the earlier promise in the book of Joel in chapter 2. He says, your young men will see vision, and your old men will dream dreams, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That's exactly the promise that we find with Philip the evangelist. Then Agabus comes to Paul and he says, suffering and death is awaiting you in Jerusalem. And Paul says, I've got to go. And so he heads back to Jerusalem and read these words in chapter 21, verse 17. We arrived in Jerusalem. The brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done amongst the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, he praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. What a great spot for us to stop. Paul's completed his third missionary journey. He's most likely has made it back for the Pentecost. And when he gets there, he wants to see James, the leader of the church. Now, this is not James the apostle. He's been killed. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. But notice, notice if you will, he gets there. Yes, he shares all the good news of his ministry. But it says it's James and the elders. The apostles aren't there. History reports, as I've shared before, that after the Council of Jerusalem, one by one, the apostles leave Jerusalem. Because they too came convinced that the gospel was not just for Jews, but for Gentiles. And it was very interesting when Elena and I went to India earlier this year. We went to southern India where Thomas was martyred. And there's tremendously strong tradition there that they record his arrival in 52 AD, fitting exactly the timetable of leaving Jerusalem in about 49 or 50 AD and traveling down the Silk Road through Antioch and then east towards India. You know, it's also encouraging that not only did Paul share good news with James and the brothers, but they shared good news with him. Look at it right here. It says, look how many thousands of Jews have believed. Remember, the church was scattered in Acts 8. Now the church at Jerusalem is once more thousands of Jews. You know, I hope that today you've gained a vision for yourself. 
that maybe you hear the Macedonian call and you're having your vision stretched. I pray that your vision is being stretched for this church, that we're going to have daily baptisms one day, that we're going to be a church of thousands, even though we're sending many people on out at this time. And that you begin to understand that world evangelism isn't just some haphazard thing. There was a strategy. There was a way to get to all men. It was clear. You went to the most influential cities of the world, and you evangelized the most influential people inside of them. What's the challenge today? It's very simple. Our four points. Uplifting vision, up. Number two, side-by-side preaching, side. Number three, knock down but not knocked out, down. And number four, make the most of today. Upside down today. That's the message for the church of the 21st century is to do what the church of the first century did. God bless you all.